I am Kizi Shako, better known as Dr. Kizi Shako. I am a forensic medical doctor. I have worked in the forensic medical space for about 12 years now. Um, and I'm also a human rights defender and I'm very passionate about child protection and advancing women's rights. I am also a mother of two lovely children <laughs> and the founder of Bunjakimia Foundation. I grew up, I'm born and bred in Nairobi. <laughs> I was born here and I've lived here like forever. Um, and so that was in 1981. So I've grown up in Nairobi. I went to school in Kilimani Junior Academy. That's where I started out. Um, ended up in Kisumu for a short while and then uh, continued my schooling here in Nairobi at Makini School and then Nairobi Academy, which is where I was from grade four all the way to my A-levels. After my A-levels, I joined University of Nairobi the same year, um, medical school. So I have a Bachelor of Medicine and Surgery from University of Nairobi. So that went on until around 2008. Um, where af afterwards I worked, you know, I did my internship and joined the forensic uh, services um, in 2010. I then also applied and joined Monash University, a master's program in forensic medicine. And coincidentally, at the same time, I was then uh, posted to work at the police surgery, which was all about forensics for the living injured. So it was really very well um, gelled together. The masters and the, the posting were very well aligned. Yes, and so that's, you know, I finished my masters in 2018. And since then, I've just been um, trying to do a lot more of advocacy work at policy level so that more people are impacted. It's really funny when I joined the forensic services. First of all, it you know, normally in in at the time uh, that was in what 2008 thereabout, we don't really get to choose where we want to go after internship. You are just sent out. But I had the opportunity to share what it is I really wanted to do, and I remember speaking to the director of medical services at the time and sharing that um, I joined medicine to work with the dead. So I wanted to do forensic pathology work, uh, working in a mortuary, and he was very confused <laughs> for a minute. He said, so you don't want a hospital setting? I was like, no, I don't want that. I just want to do investigations into crime and death. And so that's how I ended up in the forensic services. And of course, I prayed a lot for that because that was my dream. Uh, that was my childhood dream. And so I ended up working in City Mortuary. I was so excited. I know it sounds crazy, but <laughs> that was actually a dream come true for me. Um, so in 20, 2012, I was uh, posted to the police surgery. And up until then, I'd been dealing with people who were not speaking and who were dead, and you have to figure out what happened to them. And now I was meeting, I interacted with a de very different group of people who were all speaking. Most of them were in physical and emotional pain and psychological distress. Um, they could all recount what had happened to them. And that incident was like the beginning of a long journey of, of recovery um, and pain and distress and despair because many of them were going to be involved in the criminal justice system, which means they go through court and all that. Um, so for me, that really changed my perspective on things. I was very confused at first, like, what do I do with all this? <laughs> um, then I realized uh, forensics goes beyond the dead. It's actually for the living as well. In fact, everything that takes place in a forensic medical space is for the interest of those who are alive. And so it really opened my eyes. And at the same time, I had already joined a master's in forensics, which was dealing mainly with the living. I didn't know that at the time. And so this really worked out well because now I could apply what I was learning to the living and it would not have been applicable with the dead. And this I find very interesting because no one knew about it at the time that I was studying until I was almost through. So, you know, I call it divine appointment because then I discovered there's a whole field of, of 
people and, and science that has been completely untouched in our country. And so I call myself a pioneer in the field of clinical forensic medicine, which is for the living. And um, it's important because it, it, uh, it's all about evidence management, evidence collection, looking at a patient holistically beyond just evidence gathering, but also their medical needs, psychological needs, their safety needs. Um, if I get, let's say, a woman who's a victim of domestic violence, I have to think about her psychological state, her physical needs, her reproductive health needs. Um, her children, are they safe, are they not, where is she going home to, can I get her a shelter, does she need a lawyer, does she need a psychiatrist first or a psychologist first. It's a lot broader in terms of management and so I'm hoping it's a field that will grow faster rather than slower because we do have a, a sexual and gender based violence crisis on our hands at the moment. Uh, after some time I noticed that a lot of, especially sexual offences, about 90% of those were, the victims were children under 14. And you'd get histories, I would get histories of, of uh, you know, how it would, um, how these incidents would arise would be, to me, I thought, how can a parent do that? How can they just leave their child with anyone? How can, why would you let a, a, a stranger into your home? Of course, they could be dangerous. So I realized that there were things to me that may have been obvious that were not obvious to everyone. And so um, I decided to just start talking about it um, online and in a space that I have control over because getting to media personalities was proving difficult. And that's how I started blogging on a website and I called it bunjakimia.com. So for breaking the silence. So then I would upload um, a lot of information, things to uh, try and avoid doing, what to do in the event that certain incidents occur. Uh, just like giving the public information and scenarios that they should avoid or know how to navigate through. What the P3 form is about, what's a post rape care form, when does it come in handy. It is all this information that most people don't really know about until they find themselves in need. Then there's a lot of confusion, how do I go about this and that. And I, when I picked this up, I thought, let me just help how I can. And then I realized that I would have to do a bit more and I would need funding. So I registered Wunjakimi as a, a non-government organization so that we can be able to attract funding and be taken more seriously um, and do more, have a larger impact. And so that's what gave birth to Wunjakimi Foundation. So what we've managed to do so far is um, things like self-defense training for, for women and children, um, just more education, advocacy in terms of even like what I'm doing now is educating people, I hope, in some way. Um, and that's what Punja Kimia is about so far. When I was growing up, I was uh, very interested again in, in crime investigations. I don't really know what, what it is. I think it was just an inborn, inherent. Um, desire in me because it started when I observed a motor vehicle collision involving a pedestrian uh, and uh, there were police officers at the scene and the person was on the road and there was a crowd and I was extremely intrigued. I really wanted to be there and I realized that that um, desire to be part of such an investigation process just kept growing and growing. It wasn't uh, subsiding despite <laughs> being lectured by my, my parents, telling me to stop wanting to do such things, you get a normal job, you know, you'll become a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer, the usual. Um, then, uh, as I grew older, I remember during the Rwanda genocide as well, I was extremely interested by, by what was going on. Everything in me wanted to be there. And I thought, okay, who, which kind of people are at such places where there's, there's some kind of um, death or, or violent crime that has taken place? And it was police officers, journalists, um, mainly, you'd always find those. And so I also happened to have a, a, an aunt who's a police officer and she would this this time i saw her in uniform and i was just mind blown <laughs> and i thought this is what i'm supposed to be doing and i was very sure that that's what i wanted but um so anyway through all that kind of figuring out what would be the best course you know to take um, i was convinced to do medicine 
by my mother. My mom's a dentist and so I ended up in medical school. I didn't want that initially because I thought, you know, it's so hard. You know, everyone talks about how medicine is hard and long. And when you're young, you're in a hurry, you want quick, quick results. But anyway, I ended up just joining med school and um, then found out I'd have to do a course in forensic medicine or forensic pathology, which is another like eight years on top of med school. <laughs> Um, but I did it anyway, so I was very uh, sure of what it is I wanted when I was very young and, and, and I thank God for that because I find, you know, some people really struggle knowing what to do or their purpose. So when I ended up now in, in the forensic medical space with the dead, I was like, Sasa ni mefika, this is it, I've reached where I wanted to go in life and I'm happy. But when I was diverted to the living, things changed and that's where I really found out this is actually my calling. Um, the, the death was just a, an inroad to dealing and handling the living who really need the services more and need a lot. Um, they, you know, speaking for the voiceless, that's more or less what um, I do. So that part I didn't foresee, but now it's what drives me every day to keep going. <laughs> challenges I've faced as being branded <laughs> or called the first female police surgeon or first female clinical forensic expert has been this uh, you know what happens is that maybe the perception is that um, everything has has come very easily and uh, it's just because you're a female or because you look like this and like that, I've been accused of all manner of things. What people don't realize is that there's a lot of hard work that goes on behind the scenes. Even just to be able to function in such an environment where everyone has been hurt, everyone has been violated. That's, that's it every day. It, it doesn't, there's a good day is when a person is, is found guilty of a crime and you pray that they're actually guilty, you know. So that's a good day for, for people like us in the criminal justice system. So um, the challenges are, is that uh, because it's a very new field, there are certain support structures that are not present yet. When a person works in a field like this, where you're dealing with you're, you're, you're giving yourself a lot. You know, every time you hear someone speak about their problems, you carry a bit of it with you. So if you're hearing a hundred people in a day, that's quite an amount that you're carrying every day. So people in um, like humanitarian services, caregivers, need a very robust support system where you get regular debriefing, regular supervision. You need to go on holiday. Holidays are actually man a requirement so that you can decompress in a healthy manner and you are able to be with your family and friends without getting into depression or, or um, very dangerous, destructive coping mechanisms like uh, drugs, alcoholism and, and that kind of thing. What I would advise any young woman who wants to join the field of forensic medicine would be first uh, to spend time with those who are already in the field so find mentors basically um, listen to what they have to say so that when you're getting into it you know exactly what it is you're getting into um, understand uh, your yourself as a person your strengths your weaknesses what is it you would like to improve about yourself you need to ensure that you are your the clearer you are about your purpose the better life is generally whether it's in forensic medicine or in business or whatever it is it's good to know who you are and what it is you're on this earth to accomplish because we all have an assignment here that's what i truly believe and that way it makes it easier to know what to do and what not to do you waste less time then um, thirdly is to be very confident in in yourself in who you are because there will be storms that come your way and they can shake you down if you're not sure of yourself so um, just keep going get a mentor 
uh, read continuously, study continuously, do research continuously, ensure that you're always up to date with your knowledge. Because as a female, people tend to look at you as a young girl, a small girl, you know. They may not take you seriously. So you have to prove yourself by making sure that you, you really use your mind and, and, and ensure that your, the knowledge you have is, is at your fingertips. You have to be the best. You have to be the best you can be at all times. Um, because that is going to be, it will show at some point that, okay, that's actually the person for the job. Yeah, and then ensure that you have a support system and make sure that you understand what self-care is all about so that you don't get into, you don't go down a destructive path. Well, getting mentorship in, in this field is hard, especially <laughs> it's been tricky because we are so few. Um, the forensic experts in Kenya are literally a handful. And then in the, in the area where dealing with the living injured is concerned, there's really none. So I had to look for mentorship in other countries. Thankfully, because I did my master's at Monash University, which is in Australia, um, and their clinical forensic medicine is quite uh, large, it's well developed. They have already gone very far ahead in terms of processes and mechanisms in place. So I would um, speak to some of my classmates or lecturers about issues that I came across. The only challenge with that is that the, you have to contextualize information you learn to your setting for it to make sense for you but that's still very useful information then um, you know what you're doing right wrong what can be changed and all that so and then now of course there are some mentors here uh, and we would mentor each other uh, like Dr. Kelsey she's a colleague of mine the first forensic dentist in the country uh, Dr. Odwar uh, the um, he's a government pathologist I'm sure everyone knows Dr. Johansson Odor he's a forensic pathologist um, Dr. Donna Nyamunga she's also a forensic dentist so we really try to make um, the best of our situation at all time and help each other navigate through whatever issues we come across the moments that you've tried to push for certain things that you can see are required and it can take years and then when you see that actually it's coming to pass. Uh, so for example, if um, let's say because you have a forensic perspective on everything, you're able to see that um, we need to, let's say, uh, review a certain document so that it captures more information, which would be beneficial for all the players within the criminal justice system for a particular case. And then um, you have to convince the decision makers that this needs to be reviewed. And then having um, that kind of stakeholder gathering take place just to review that particular document. And then everyone agrees to reviewing it and we actually review it and fix it um, and, and submit it to the relevant offices. That has happened once or twice. And um, I think that for me is a very major achievement <laughs> given that we are in a setting that is still just catching up uh, on, on the best practice uh, standards for forensic medical practice in, in the country and, and globally. So that has been some of the, the highlights that, um, that I can speak of. The lessons learned over the years, the first one is self-care. <laughs> You absolutely have to understand the need to take care of yourself in whatever field you're in. Um, and, and I find that maybe even more so for women because we, I think we are brought up in a culture where we just give, give, give of ourselves. And many of us are not really taught that you also matter equally, if not more, because you need to give out from the overflow not from what you require for yourself. So self-care is very important. Learn how to take a time out, setting boundaries. Don't, don't do too much all the time. Like you need to be very intentional about taking care of yourself, eating properly, exercising, meditation, such, such things. Then um, understanding my purpose for me was one of the biggest, uh, uh, biggest wins for me because it really guides my steps it's like a blueprint or a roadmap 
and that has caused me to have and make deliberate decisions on what I will do and not do. I wish I was told my my what that inner voice that speaks to me is usually right and so i should just follow it because then i would not have made so many mis not really mistakes but um dilly dallying mm. taking long to make decisions on certain issues so i would have uh, you know spent less time doubting myself secondly i wish i was told to pick up on a business administration course to enhance my financial literacy. I think everyone must take time to enhance their financial literacy. You don't want to wake up at 40 and realize you don't know anything about money. <laughs> because again, that can influence even the decisions you make on how you're going to take time, spend your time so that you can set yourself up properly. By the time you're 40, 45, 50, you're not still um, struggling looking for, for funding, but you've built yourself something and um, that uh, your best is is always best uh, and if your best is not good enough it's okay don't don't kill yourself over it it's never that serious Within the superb 100-acre mixed-use Two Rivers development, Cascadia Apartments combines comfort, convenience and luxury living, making it the ultimate choice for your home. Life at Cascadia is nothing short of a dream. When you want to enjoy luxurious downtime, Cascadia, which is located within the thriving social city of Two Rivers, affords you immediate access to fine dining restaurants, entertainment, fashion avenues, hypermarkets and plenty of green parks.